Hi everyone, I want to talk about frostbite. Frostbite. Are you familiar with that? Okay, let's go. Frostbite is a cold injury that is due to freezing of tissue. It is localized and could be severe or mild most of the times. There are certain times one is non-freezing cold injury, that is NFCI, or some people will call it the Martian foot. That may cause tissue loss. May also have long-term complications. It's possible you see something like redness or edematous, very painful, or hemorrhagic. This injury is worsened with tight boots and socks. It is common among soldiers. Could be relieved by frequent changing of the socks or wearing less tight boots. That is also what we call frost grip. That is cold induced and localized paresthesia. It is not a permanent problem but could be resolved by rewarming quickly. There's another phenomenon called perineal or chiblains. That is also a localized inflammatory lesion. It is occurring when there's exposure to damp cold. The affected parts will become edematous, red, painful, and pyritic commonly occurring amongst young women. There will be no permanent damages and there is possibility of complete resolution in three weeks. What are the possible risk factors? One, increased heat loss. When there is increased loss, or there's decreased heat production, then we are at risk of frostbite the more. Also, it depends on the wind. Frostbite will be stronger in areas with windy environment. That is why it is advisable to watch your weather forecast, particularly the wind chill level before getting out of your shelter or home. Also, contact with metal, metal, metal or ground. When the affected individual is having direct contact with metal or the ground, then the risk will increase. What about tiredness? People that are tired will not be able to walk around because when you walk around, you like exercise yourself a bit, produce heat within to help you. But to those who are tired, that might be impossible. Then they are more prone to frostbite. How about the hydration? Yes. And malnutrition? Yes. Peripheral vascular disease, because when there is ischemic situation, that is, the blood is not flowing very well, even when you exercise and you do everything to generate heat internally, and the rate at which the blood is circulating throughout the body is impaired by any form, then the heat will not be evenly distributed, particularly to the regions that are more prone to frostbite. We'll go to that in a bit. Diabetes mellitus, for many of the reasons highlighted above, diabetes mellitus will likely have peripheral vascular disease, it could be dehydrated, it could be malnourished, it could be weak, tired, and so on. Psychiatric cases, wow, because most psychiatry patients will not be able to think straight or think right, might not be able to decide on the best type of clothes to wear and how appropriately to put them on, like putting the socks too tight or not, 
or the boot too tight or not, or even appropriate socks, appropriate boot, appropriate covering of the hands and the face and so on might not be. And most of them can even be on the street for longer period of time. So psychiatry patients are prone to frostbites. Still on risk factors, alcohol abuse will have increased heat loss and they will also have what is called vasodilation, particularly those that are on alcohol for a long period of time. So chronic consumption of alcohol is a big risk factor to frostbite. Sedatives, imagine that. Someone is on heavy, maybe benzodiazepine, the judgment is impaired. For what I've just said about psychiatric cases in a while ago is also applicable here. When somebody is under the influence of hypnosis or any of the sedatives and the judgment is impaired, they will not be able to decide on the appropriate outfit for the weather and they could be prone to frostbite. Smoking, hmm. some will argue, smoking, when you are smoking, you are producing heat. Well, <clears throat> that might be your argument, but smoking for a long period of time will lead to all sorts of ischemic situations within the system. And that is a negative. It's not a plus when it comes to frostbite. Poor dressing, yes. I cannot overemphasize this enough. Poor dressing or inappropriate dressing for the weather. Because this is just a situation that is within our own reach to handle. Anybody could do anything to prevent frostbite. And the most important of them all is the dressing. So Poor dressing or inappropriate dressing. This is not the time to show anything. I don't want to use some terms here because of the possibility of kids also watching my video. So you understand what I'm talking about, right? Okay, vibrations. So if you are close to a place that is vibrating or something is vibrating around you and there's every windshield outside there, you are likely going to come down with frostbite. Exposure to ice packs, okay? You can pause and read this very well. Exposure to ice packs without outside cold winds can still lead to frostbite. For example, it might be summertime, somebody has ankle injury and you want to help, you get the ice packs from your deep freezer or anywhere, if you apply it directly on the skin for more than 20 minutes, the individual could come down with frostbite at that region. So what good nurses will do is they will place clothes in between the ice packs and the skin. And you are not going to allow that to stay more than 20 minutes per treatment. Okay, so in summer, it's possible to have frostbite without a cold wind if you are using ice packs but not placed appropriately. Still on risk factors. Inhalation of allogenated hydrocarbons to the face, to the upper airway, or to the oesophageal region can give frostbites in all those regions. Freon is used as a refrigerant. That could also cause frostbite when it is in contact with fingers. So you could see that it is not only when there is cold outside there and then you are exposed or you didn't dress well that you could have frostbite. You could have frostbite even during summertime. Okay? CO2, that is carbon dioxide fire extinguisher, or some we call carbon four oxide. Okay? 
when someone is exposed to carbon dioxide or some will call it carbon dioxide fire extinguisher on a sprained ankle to reduce the dimmer, you may come down with frostbite. I'm not saying it's a bad practice, but you just note this, that from that help is likely if it's for too long period of a time or there is ischemia in the region that is being exposed to CO2 or carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide fire extinguisher for a long period of time, you could have frostbite. So sum it together. It is not only in winter that you have frostbite. Okay, epidemiology. Well, frostbite will occur anywhere there is cold, and even in regions without cold. Based on my presentation, you could review those risk factors again. Okay, but the parts that are more prone to frostbite are the hands. That is including the fingers, the feet, and the toes, the face, and of course the ears. The part of physiology here is essentially that there will be cold induced cell death. Like I've said, not only in winter time, please, but 98% of the times it will be winter time. Okay? So there's cold induced cell death. Reperfusion, inflammatory process will be set in place. Ischemia of the affected tissue will occur, and of course that will worsen the situation. Ischemia could be the reason why the region is prone to frostbite initially, and when there is frostbite, there will be ischemia. Then formation of ice crystals inside the cells if the freezing is very rapid, imagine that, filling ice crystals underneath your skin is possible. Troposin A2, postaglandin F2, bradykinase, and histamines are all involved here. Then there will be necrosis after all those gamut of biochemical processes have occurred. Toy and refreezing. I want you to get this clearly. Toying and refreezing will worsen the situation. In other words, someone had frostbite. You have helped him or her to get taught, and then you release him or her to walk home exposed to the same, you no, know, very cold wind chill and refreezing or cause again, then the second time will be worse than the first. What are the clinical features? Of course, cold. The affected parts will be cold for sure. Then, numbness, clumsiness, changes in color of the skin, from white to red to gray, and you could feel something hard or wazzy. I've told you it's possible you have eye crystals formed underneath the skin if the freezing is very rapid. And sometimes you have bully, you know, escar formation, cyanosis. When there's cyanosis, it's likely the individual will have to take thrombolytic agents for the treatment of the frostbite. That's surprising, right? From frostbite to taking thrombolytic agent, yes, let's get to the treatment. It's possible. And the last stage of frostbite is gangrene. And when gangrene has occurred, man, nothing more. Amputation immediately. Okay. What are the four stages? And I'm going to base this based on hand and feet involvement. Okay? Four stages are different from the four degrees of depth. I'll talk about that in a bit. So, the four stages, or some call it grace, 
who they grade one, there will be no cyanosis, and that is very mild. Well, if I will have frostbite, I'll be okay with that. I think I've had that a couple of times, where I shove in snow on that very, very low you know, wind chair. Grade two, cyanosis to distal phalanx. At that stage, amputation of the soft tissue, fingernail or the toenail will be required. Okay? Then at grade three, that will be intermediate and proximal phalanx will become cyanosed. An amputation of the digit will be necessary. Grade four, that is, Kappa or tarsal cyanosis, and if we find that, then the entire limb will have to be amputated. You can pause and grow through this grace one by one again. Okay. Now, four degrees of tissue depth. The first that is what most centers will capitalize on. The first degree, when it comes to frostbite, is superficial. There will be pallor, loss of pain, that is anesthesia, edema in surrounding areas. But when it comes to the second degree of tissue depth involvement, there will be large blisters, edema and erythema, there will be no tissue loss. Escars may be formed here. At third degree level, that will inv involve deeper parts of the tissue. So deeper injury with small blisters could be hemorrhagic bleeding. Occur most of the times at the proximal parts of the body. And the S cast here will have black colors. At fourth degree, muscle is penetrated deep down to the bone. So the bones will be affected. And there will be complete tissue necrosis. And of course, nothing more than amputation. Do we need imaging while assessing anyone with frostbite? Um, frostbite is clinically diagnosed, but most centers will have x-rays down to know whether the bones are affected. You could have angiography, and if the center is very rich or highly equipped, you have technetium, Nine-nine scintigraphy to determine if thrombolytic agent will be required or not. In other words, TC nine-nine scintigraphy is for determination of thrombolytic suitability. Of course, we need to rule out contraindications to thrombolytic agents as well before any doctor will place anyone on thrombolytic agent. We'll get to that in a bit. There's what it calls single photon emission tomography with CT or specs slash CT. You can do that if your center is rich. And you can also do magnetic resonance angiography to know the level of ischemia or not. Okay, treatment. This is what you're looking for, right? Some will say, oh. Talking about too many things, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nurse. Well, doctors, nurses, and entire public will benefit from my video. So, my presentation is for everybody. So, if you are not a doctor and you want to handle your children during winter time, or even not winter, summer, and they have an injury and you want to put your ice pack, you've gotten that. Okay, now let's go to treatment proper. Pre-hospital treatment. This will likely be family level or EMS people. First of all, splint or part of the area affected. Okay? 
take the individual out of the code, take the person to a warm place, that is, we can get one. That's funny, right? Remove all word talk. I think that's what's going to, you're not going to remove all word talk right there under the horrible wind chair. Okay, that's why I didn't start with that. Because somebody will sue me later on that he told me to remove all words of even under minus 50 degrees Celsius outside there. No. Get a warm place, then remove all wet tops. Don't let him or her walk on the damaged feet. No. So you have to get somebody to help and lift him or her so that the feet will not go worse from that. Okay? Rewarm. But don't refreeze. If you are not sure of refreezing, then don't start rewarming. Remember, I said a few minutes ago that if you rewarm and the individual is exposed to freezing again, then the second time the frostbite will be horrible. So if you are not sure, that this person will get to a, co a, a warm place or this person will have a ride home or to the hospital, then don't start the rewarming. Because if you start the rewarming and tell the person, oh, God bless you, go home in peace, and he or she is re-exposed to the horrible wind chair, then the first bite, the second time, will be horrible than the one you have helped him or her with. Rewarm with warm water. You can place fingers in hampers. Don't use stove. Don't use fires, please. So don't work on somebody with frostbite and place the person in front of your fireplace. Or take person to your kitchen and turn on four points on your stove and tell the person place the finger here. No. No. Okay, at the hospital, well, someone will say, this is not my business, this is for doctors and nurses. I've said it. My video is not for just a group, it's for everybody. So, rewarming at the hospital will be heated water for 38 degrees Celsius. And immersion will follow for about 30 minutes. If your syndrome is highly sophisticated with whipple, Equipment, whipple treatment is better. Okay, you rotate the body pass gently. Okay, there may be pain with the rewarming. So you can give your anagepsis before then. Thrombolytic agents. Remember, I said before, if you see cyanosis or you do technetum 9, 9 uh, um, scintigraphy to determine thrombolytic agent suitability and so on. Thrombolytic agent, if the individual is presenting less than 24 hours of the injury, okay? So you can use TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, or a prene or a nosoprene, but we have to roll out the contraindications to thrombolytic agents before administration. And I'm not going to waste my time going over all the contraindications to thrombolytic agent. Go and check my videos on the treatment of heart attack. I have listed all those there. And also in the treatment of pulmonary embolism. I've listed all those there. Okay, TPA first. Tissue plasminogen activator first. When you use TPA first, then you can place the individual on enosaprine, one milligram per kilogram, so killed twice daily for the next 14 days. That's why I wrote 14 over 7. That is 14 days. Prostacycline therapy. Prostacycline therapy could be given within 48 hours of injury. So it's a vasodilator. Example is alloprost. If you administer prostacycline, that would decrease the rate of amputation. 
and the individual and the entire family will be grateful for that. Can still on one care. Can you check my video on one care? Because I've made a separate video on one care and I don't want to waste your time going over that here. Okay, thanks. Tetanus vaccine. We need to know if this individual is up to date. The last 10 years, just check the record. Antibiotics. Good. Depending on the judgment and, of course, the protocol as a center. Non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs for pain and inflammation. Avoid occlusive dressings because tight clothing, tight boots, tight socks actually will predispose to frostbite. So, here we want you to dress, but not occlusive dressings. Dry the wound before dressing and surgery if you think that amputation will be required here. Petrosifilin, yeah, this could be controversial because some centers are against the use of penicillin that is printer for this purpose, Why some are pretty comfortable with that. So depending on your jurisdiction and the protocol at your center. Pasiotomy, of course, if there's compartment syndrome, and of course, if there is signs, you know, or there are signs of numbness, paresthesia, and so on, that the nerves have been compressed. As karyotomy for the same purpose, and of course, wound debridement. What are the possible complications? Gangrene. I should place that last, but I'm going to place it first because when there is gangrene, there's no debate here. We don't need that limb anymore. That will lead to amputation. And that's very bad and sad because the individual will not be able to use that part of the body anymore. Okay? Infection. And that's why so many centers will use antibiotic coverage to prevent secondary bacteria infection. Compartment syndrome. When there is a scarf compressing that, or fascia, you no, know, everything compressing you know, that part of the limb. Scarring, joint pains, arthritis, neuropathy, aposthesia, chronic pain, and growth abnormalities. I wrote in pedo that is in children. Okay, prevention is cheaper and is better than kill. So I will pay more attention to this prevention and that is the main reason why my channel has even existed in the first place. Prevention, dress warm, no tight boots, no tight socks. Please. Decrease boozing, decrease alcohol, decrease smoking, or even stop completely. If you are going out in winter time, increase hydration. Okay, increase your calorie intake so that you will have enough to produce endogenous heat. Decrease contact with metals. Decrease contact with the ground if you if you can do that because some will pull out particularly kids they pull out their socks pull pull out their boots and then be walking on the snow no watch weather forecast and dress appropriately so many countries have dedicated so many channels for weather forecast only I think we should. I appreciate government doing that. Watch the wind chill. So many radio channels will tell you that. Okay? Watch the wind chill. Seek warm environment as quickly as possible. Then you can use eight packs intermittently. And that is why when you board plane on long flight, 
particularly across the Atlantic or across the Pacific, in between the flight at night, they will give you warm blankets. They know what they are doing. So use heat packs intermittently. And with that, I've come to the end of this presentation. I hope this will benefit somebody somewhere. Thanks for listening. Kindly subscribe to my channel so that you can get my presentations immediately they are published. Thank you. I appreciate that.